we've come to the kind of the end of our series um, in Isaiah by coming looking at uh, chapter 65. And uh, if you can kind of remember some of the imagery that we've had of this triangle uh, that kind of goes down into a small bit that was focused. So um, it started off with God's intention for the whole uh, of creation to uh, honour and worship him. And then of course that didn't go well, so there was a people um, that we see in Abraham. And eventually there was a, a small and true Israel remnant and then we had the suffering servant where God was going to turn everything around just because of that one person. And then Adam began to explore with us um, last week a little bit about how uh, there was a new purpose, there would be a new Israel uh, that would come. And uh, what we see here in chapter 65 is the kind of, in a sense, the inversion, so we're back where we started, with the, the, the hope of the nations because this true Israel, this true Israel, um, who have been through all of this, who have been through exile and return and others, they still are not living according to the one who is uh, the suffering servant who called them. And so uh, we come to uh, the moment where Isaiah says, actually, uh, Lord, what are you going to do? And God says, well, actually, I'm, I'm not just going to have a little people, I'm going to have people from all the nations. So that's a little bit of the kind of the flow that we get from Isaiah. But just before this, because we've had, of course, the wonderful uh, words from uh, Isaiah 53, for example, that we've had, which we'll be looking at again when we uh, approach Easter, uh, as Patrick was saying to us. But as Isaiah unfolds this vision of what God is going to do and the greatness of it, of it all, uh, he gets um, a little bit impatient. Sorry, I'll be going to click it. He gets a little bit impatient. Sorry, that's a... Uh, and uh, he wants to know what's going on. And so what we'll see is, we'll see these four things. The eagerness of God, the authenticity of God. We will see uh, a creating God rejoicing. And we will see uh, the eagerness of God forever. But he's a bit fed up because he can't wait. Uh, and so if you go back to, uh, just flip back, if you've got a Bible, it's page 7. 5, 2. Uh, Isaiah 64.1 says, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountain might quake in your presence. What he wants to know is, you know, God, when are you going to do something? You've given me these fantastic words of hope and expectation. When are you going to do what you said you were going to do? Can you not just get on with it? I want to see it now. But of course, what Isaiah realizes is that God is gracious. Uh, and the reason that he doesn't come down is because, of course, uh, he is giving us time. He's giving us time to put ourselves right with him. So in 64, he says, uh, You, O oh Lord, are our Father. We are the clay, and you are the potter. We're all the work of your hands. Don't be so terribly angry, O oh Lord. And remember not our sins forever. Behold, please look, we are your people. Uh, and so what we see then, so what we see, what we see then, in a sense, is that God is going to do something different, but we have to be patient for it. And Isaiah says, okay, let me know what it's going to be like. And so 65 begins, I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I, I was ready to be found by those who didn't seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that was not called by my name. This is what God's going to do. He's going to have everybody, everybody coming to him. God is eager. Uh, a few years ago, we were uh, with our children on a holiday. Uh, we're actually, at, uh, we were somewhere in the east of France. And uh, they were small and we'd been away for quite a while and we were tired. Uh, and we found a lovely, lovely park. Uh, and we sat and we had lunch in the park. And there was no one else around. 
Uh, and there were some trees around the edges. And we said to the kids, why don't you go and play hide and seek? Why don't we, have, why don't we all have a game of hide and seek? Uh, and they said, oh yeah, 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 that'd be really, really good. And I said, right, you go off and hide, uh, and then I'll come and find you. And I started counting in a loud voice. They all ran off, I think they went off in pairs, and then hid behind some trees, and Annie and I sat back against the tree and said, oh, isn't this piece of last? <laughs> and we sat there for about five, ten minutes, enjoying that moment, <laughs> until Johnny, always the earliest one, came out of his trees and walked up to us where we were sitting and said, Daddy, you're supposed to come and look for us. <laughs> oh, I? <laughs> oh, we were really enjoying this game. He said, that's not how you play it, Daddy. Okay, Jonathan. So right, you can often hide again, and I'll come and look for you. He goes, no, Daddy. <laughs> he says, you won't you'll do the same again. Let me show you how to play. <laughs> uh, uh, and so uh, we were dragged off. It would be really easy, wouldn't it, to think that uh, in a sense, God is like that. That we have to come back to God and say, you know, God, here I am. But actually, as we read in Genesis chapter 3, it's not God who is hiding. It's humanity that's hiding. Because actually when God goes looking for them, they realise their unworthiness that actually they're frightened and afraid. And actually, the people run away. They don't come back to God and say, here I am, come looking for me. And Paul, in the first century, noticed this about his own people. He saw that there were so few Jewish people who accepted Jesus as their Messiah. But actually, it was the Gentiles that were running to Jesus in droves. Why wasn't the opposite happening? Israel had a rich background with God. They'd been schooled in the Messianic prophecies of Isaiah and all the other prophets for centuries. Surely, once you've read Isaiah accepting Jesus and his death on the cross and seeing that, surely that should be really, really easy. But they were continuing to turn away. And at the same time, it was the, uh, the Gentiles, the non-Jewish Christians, who'd never been in a covenant relationship with God, who had no training in biblical understanding of, of God, or his prophets, or his laws. They were the ones who got it. And when Paul wanted to know why this was happening, well, he came back to these verses in Isaiah chapter 65. You can read them in Romans chapter 10, verses 20 and 21. And he found that in, that in Isaiah, that Israel's problem wasn't a lack of information or preparation. The problem was served up in verse 2. All day long I have held out my hands to an obstinate people who walked in ways not good, Pursuing their own righteousness. A people who continually provoke me to my very face. God calls all the ones that we heard about last week um, from Adam about this people that would be formed again um, post exile and all the rest of it to be the people who were eager to turn to God. They didn't. G.K. Chesterton um, wrote a very, very interesting thing. He said, when people stop believing in God, it's not that they believe in nothing. It's that they will believe in anything. Not nothing, anything. And you see, that's the irony of these verses, if you read through uh, verses 3 to 7. is that It's not that the Jewish people have become irreligious. They'd become very religious. Adam referred to it last time, last week, about the things that they were building, in, uh, all the uh, pagan worship that was brought into the temple, about the king who was himself, the king of God's people, himself was involved in child sacrifice. That's referred to in these verses 3 to 7. 
Paul talks about this again in Romans 10. You'll need to look at, go maybe read that at home. Because actually, what we see in Romans 10 is that rather than following the way God wants them to go, they'd gone, everyone, to their own way. Those words from Isaiah 53. It, we have strayed much more sheep, everyone, to his or her own way. Not that they'd given up on God. They just made up their own religions. And verses 3 to 7 talks about that, and Romans 10 talks about that. Just the sadness of people that think that they can do it their way, and that will be okay. So, verses 8 to 17 tells us a little bit about what does authenticity with God look like. And there are some just some important things there, aren't there? About knowing that we need to trust God and walk in his way. As the new wine is found in the cluster and they say, do not destroy it, for there is a blessing in it. So I will do for my servant's sake and not destroy them all. I wonder, can you see those well enough? Probably not. I wonder if you can tell the difference between those two vineyards. And which one might produce expensive wine and which one not so good? Both in France. You see, what's interesting, if you're, sorry if you're not into wine, <laughs> but what is interesting about the way in which wine is picked is that in certain places, they just use tractors and they go along uh, and everything is 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 um, along lines of wire to make it easier for the tracks to go, and just everything gets harvested uh, into um, it, it kind of into the vats, uh, and then you will have um, you will have uh, grapes, you will have a uh, few leaves, you might even have a few twigs, uh, you might have you'll have all the good grapes, you'll have a few of them not so good grapes that are hard and shriveled, uh, you might also have a few little insects and worms um, that get into it, and all gets put in together, and all gets, you know, all gets squashed together, which means probably if you're a vegetarian, you shouldn't have cheap wine. Um, but uh, uh, also, what happens in, with the more expensive one is that actually they have people who go along and it's cut by hand, and therefore they only take the good grapes. I think that's what uh, Jesus, uh, Isaiah is saying, Jesus, <laughs> Isaiah is saying in verse 8, as when juice is still found in a cluster of grapes, and people say, don't destroy. What I think there is, what God is saying is, I don't just pick everything up and dump it in the vats. I, and whatever it is, whatever state, I, I, I am a selective farmer. I will go along and I will make sure that the very, very best and what is good is part of my people. Equally, I'm not just going to throw everything away because a little bit of it is not very good. Or the second imagery, of course, is even better. Uh, when it talks a little bit about the valley of Achor. Do you know what the valley of Achor is? It's verse 10. Sharon will become a pasture of flocks and the valley of Achor a resting place for herds. If you don't remember the valley of Achor, I didn't, I had to look it up. Uh, it's in Joshua chapter 7. Uh, and Joshua chapter 7 tells about how the, the people of God sinned so terribly against God that they were punished. Uh, and there was judgment, and they, some of them died. And the place was covered in rocks so that nothing would grow. That's the Valley of Acre. It's a place of desolation, of death. Which is amazing, because what Isaiah is saying is, God will take that place of sinfulness and judgment and death and make it live. It will become a green pasture. It will become sustaining. It will become full of life. So this is transformative. 
What we see in verses 8 to 16, and I'm not going to go through the rest, but what you see in these verses is God saying, I know what you're like, but I will be transformative. But you need to delight in what I delight in. I don't know if you've seen the film Invictus um, about uh, the Rugby World Cup in uh, 1995. Uh, and it's called Invictus because of the poem that's been written, Invictus. Do you know how it goes? Remember it? Let me to read it to you. It matters not how straight the gates, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. It sounds great, doesn't it? But actually, it's the antithesis of what we read in 65. We can't, on our own, turn an acorn from a place of death and destruction into life and life-giving and glorious. We're not the captains of our soul, free to determine what we think is best, how we should live. Doing as uh, Adam was referring to last week, those kings who said, actually, I'll do whatever I wish. No, we cannot be like that. Uh, and so uh, there is the reality of judgments. And verse 12 makes it really, really clear, doesn't it, that we have decisions. I will destiny for the sword, and all of you will fall and slaughter, talking to those who reject him. From the earlier verses, for I have called, for I called you, but you did not answer. I spoke to you, but you did not listen. You did evil in my sight and chose what displeases me. That balance of hope, but also there is a cost, and the cost is that we are called in response to God's grace to think about how we live, whether we trust God whether we are obedient to him, whether we serve others, whether we pray for our world, whether we pray for thy kingdom come. There is an urgency to living this life because that is what authenticity before God looks like. And there is an urgency to it because, of course, it's the 1 Peter 3.15, isn't it? Live in such a way that people want to know the reasons for the hope you have in you. But also back to Romans uh, chapter 10, you know, how will people be able to know about Jesus unless they've heard us? How will they hear unless somebody tells them? How will somebody tell them unless they are sent? There is an urgency for Christians to live in the right way and proclaim in the right way. And so it goes on. Be glad and rejoice forever in what in that which I create, for behold I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. C.S. Lewis wrote this. The life you've longed for but has always eluded you always kept just out of reach. That life is what God is preparing for his servants. The place to which God is taking us is the human experience divine that defines the very meaning of joy. C.S. Lewis went on, he said, if I find in myself a mystery as, or a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy, that does not prove that the universe is a fruit. Probably earthly pleasures were never meant to fully satisfy, but only to arouse, to suggest the real thing. I must make it the main object of life to press on to that other country and to help others do the same. And so what C.S. Lewis is saying is actually there is in all of us that yearning, that longing. We'd love to see vegetarian lions. We'd love to have our giraffes safe. We'd love to live in, uh, just to um, 
pick out some of the verses. Verse 20 talks about the fact that we'd love to be in a place where there is no injustice, where actually people are safe. Uh, chapter 20, sorry, verse 21 talks about uh, how we can have security in our own homes. Gosh, aren't there millions at the moment who would know that who would love to be in a home that was safe, but they had nothing to fear. Uh, there would be verse twenty-two talks about things that satisfy, so that you'd, you you wouldn't always be saying, "Can I have a bit more? Can I have a bit more?" I just it's not quite enough. And of course, it goes on verse twenty-two to talk about how Adam references how Genesis chapter three is so important because. Uh, uh, he talked last week about toil and what we see here is the expulsion of the garden that was there at the end of chapter 3 it's overturned because we're invited back in to live in God's presence Uh, and that's the hope God says let me just show you how you can be with me how you can experience me how you can know me and this is something that's going to be really, really good. And it finishes with those in verses uh, 24 and 25. The wolf and the lion shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, vegetarian lions, and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. My giraffe. It's going to have a lion as its best buddy. Uh, and so the question that we were asking earlier, how? It goes back to the very beginning, isn't it? When's it going to be? Rend the heavens, O Lord, uh, Isaiah 64. Do it now. Why is God patient and waiting? He's waiting for us to share this news so that others may turn to him. He's been patient because actually if he were to come now, he would see our sinfulness, he would see so much of the world that's turned against him and rejected him. And therefore in his graciousness, he is giving us time. So if you'd like to see lions in church, if you'd like to see Phil come along with his pet lion, vegan in tow, uh, and, and know that actually we're completely and utterly safe, well, the answer is we need to be telling people about Jesus. We need the world to know that there is going to be a new heaven and a new earth. It's continuous. It's not a replacement, but it's going to be transformed and made new. Uh, and that we have a glorious hope but that we are to live in the light of that hope. That's what he wants us to do. So if we are to conclude, um, how do you sum up uh, the whole of Isaiah and what he's saying just in a few words, then it's these. Don't give up because the hope of your calling is glorious. Don't give up because the hope of your calling is glorious. And the second thing is, don't give, keep on going because God is faithful and will do this. And if you're unsure, look to the cross. Because the cross is God's demonstration in human history of his love, his graciousness, his forgiveness, and his calling of all nations. So that's our son in a nutshell. And for us, what it means is that we have something great and glorious. And we look around and we're thinking, wouldn't it be great actually if this place were full to bursting? Wouldn't it be great if more people knew this? If people caught on to the vision of what God wants to do through his people, what God wants to do for our world, what God wants to do for creation, what he wants to do for giraffes, or for whichever animal that is that you like that might get eaten. Let's not give up hope. Let's remember that 
God has entrusted this to us. His plan, it's us. Let's make sure we live it, we walk it, and we talk it. Let me pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you that uh, Isaiah ends uh, so full of hope and excitement at what you can do, what you have done, and what you will be doing. Help us as we go into Easter just to be full of joy, the wonder uh, of all of that. And help it to live deeply within us and to be shining out from us. For your glory.